agenda. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Modric, Modric uh, seconded by Nordstrom. All in favor? Aye. And the agenda is adopted. Now it's time for general public comment, a time for members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the committee on any issue not limited to items on the agenda. Action will not be taken at the meeting on any issue not in the agenda except by placement on the agenda by unanimous vote of the aldermen present. And I have no request forms. One, no one. The general public is now closed. That moves us on to consent items one through four. Public comment is now opened and I have no request forms for those either. Public comment is closed. And now it's time for the uh, members of the committee to remove any items from the consent that they'd like to discuss. I have no uh, lights or requests, so uh, the, um, <laughs> okay, Nordstrom moves to approve. Second. Second by Modric, and um, all in favor of the, uh, just passing the consent items? Aye. All, all opposed? And they're, they're approved. That brings us to non-consent items, items five through eight. So we'll go to um, public comment for items five through eight. Um, Kyle, would you, where is Kyle? Would you like to wait until your items come up? Okay, thank you. So public comment is now closed on items five through eight. That brings us to a special presentation, upgrade and changes to Pleasant Valley Substation, Machu Sarah and Mark Iyer, Black Hills Energy. This is item number five. Make sure this is on, oh, there it, it works, all right. Well, thank you all. My name is Machu Sarah. I'm the Senior Program Manager for, of Community Affairs for Black Hills Energy. And Mark here behind me, he's a Director of Electric Operations. Um, we're here to just basically present to you a project that's going to be happening in 2019, but we're working on the preliminary side of it as far as communications and engineering and designing as we speak. Um, I'm going to just introduce again Mark. He's our Director of Electric Operations here in South Dakota. Dakota, and uh, he'll be giving the entire presentation and answering questions along with two other individuals. Zane Hasse, who is here, he's our project manager, and Mike Pogany is our manager of electric operations, us located here in Rapid City. Um, so we also have some technical expertise in case there's a technical question need to be asked. With that being said, I'll give it to Mark. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, get on the agenda today. Like much, uh, much mentioned, we just want to give an update on our intentions to upgrade our Pleasant Valley substation. And so uh, feel free if you have any questions. Uh, we have a couple slides to go through, but uh, if you have any questions, please stop me and we'd be happy to, to discuss those and talk about those. So uh, moving on to slide three, we wanted to just kind of give an overview of where the Pleasant Valley substation fits in our overall um, electric grid and kind of what we're discussing. So obviously we have power generation um, primarily in the Gillette and Cheyenne, Wyoming areas, some power generation here in, in Rapid City as well. Um, we transport power across uh, high voltage transmission lines Then when we get them into the, the region we're serving, the Rapid City area, we have transmission substations that bump that voltage down to a distribution voltage that goes throughout uh, the community and then in local um, neighborhoods we have local distribution substations that then break that voltage or drops that voltage down even uh, lower uh, that goes into alleys and neighborhoods and serves individual uh, commercial and residential customers and so that's where the Pleasant Valley substation kind of fits in it's a distribution substation so it's primary focus is, or I guess purpose, is to lower the, the voltage um, to go to customers. So, uh, so just a little bit about the Pleasant Valley substation. It was originally constructed in 1975, so it is uh, 43 plus years old, and that's really the, the main driver behind the, um, the rebuild. Uh, it serves just, uh, just under 3,000 customers in that West Chicago area. I think the, uh, the address of the substation is 3919 West Chicago Boulevard. So it's just, um, if you're on West Chicago, just west of the intersection with Sturgis Road. So, uh, and again, it's a distribution substation. And obviously, system conditions have changed since 1975. I guess our footprint at that area. As with everything, um, safety is our top priority at Black Hills Energy, so we, we have a comprehensive safety plan and 
and we'll be very mindful of that in, in our communications with the neighbors in the neighborhood there, letting them know what's going on and that we'll have that site secure during construction um, for the safety of the residents and, and the public in that area. This is a kind of a Google image that shows the, the view from um, the sky there, so you can kind of see the footprint. It, um, is wedged in between those two residential lots and you can kind of see uh, the equipment that's there today and so it'll be similar footprint and layout in the future um, you know the the equipment enclosures that we have uh, might be located in a different location inside the substation but overall um, very similar uh, footprint so this is kind of just a diagram of uh, kind of the profile of what the equipment that will be installed will look like um, with the transformer there in the middle being the, the kind of key part of the substation. Again, yeah, just that picture to see how it looks today. And um, then uh, to the schedule and the timing. So as much mentioned, uh, we're finishing up the design and engineering now. Um, got a pretty good wrap on that. And we've kind of started into our communication plan. Um, we've already talked to some of the public officials and, and made them aware of uh, this project, uh, obviously talking um, with you today. And then following this, uh, we have a communication plan to directly reach out to those residents that are adjacent and in the neighborhood. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, in the neighborhood of that substation. So um, both in person and mailings uh, to make sure that they're aware of it and address any concerns that they might have with the construction um, timeline. We've also uh, committed and are excited to be a part of some of the neighborhood meetings that um, are planned for this fall and would be happy to participate in any way we can with those. So, uh, And then uh, construction, so we'll start some pre-construction work in January. Really, it will kick off in February. Um, so there might be during times where we're taking some of that equipment out or bringing some of the equipment in, we might have to have some lane closures and we'll make sure that we get the proper permits for those and, and minimize that time. Um, but construction will be in swing until June uh, 2019 and uh, we'll have it energized in service and uh, back feeding customers. So. Just some key contacts here, so you have these on, in your uh, slide handouts today, so feel free to contact me, uh, much as is uh, contact information provided as well as uh, our project manager for this uh, zane. So I guess with that, just kind of a quick update on what we're doing, um, what you can expect to see there, and if there's any questions, we'd be happy to address those. Uh, we do have some questions, so Good. the chair recognizes Lisa Modric. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I'd like to start with a motion to acknowledge the report. Second. Motion to acknowledge by Modric, second by Nordstrom. All in favor? Can I retain oh, the floor? Oh, sorry. I always move too fast. I sorry. know it. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, and um, I, it's great to have the team here for the answers, and where you're headed with this on Chicago, there is a, a great opportunity, and perhaps I I'm missing where that scope is going to fall into, but the great opportunity is to allow this to be, become part of the neighborhood, the residential area, such as what was done on Cleveland. And I would hope that that starts going into the scope of the project. This is the perfect opportunity as these 43-year-old, uh, 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 your infrastructure yeah. continues to need to be replaced. So is this, can this, will this become something where the fencing which creates the safety is visually beautiful, as attractive to the neighborhood, just like it can be to a, a business corridor. Yeah, for the Cleveland Street stuff, this is a little bit different based on the, the space constraints. And so we're really tight on the sides of what we can do within the property that we own. And so um, we are looking at what we can do for that front facial piece that you can see from the road. The sides were pretty well constrained on our footprint of what that would uh, take away in space. Um, but the front, we're certainly looking at options. And I would suspect part of our communication with the neighboring 
um, residential customers that we could kind of talk with them. Also, we own that little piece from the substation fence to the city right away. Right now it's grass. We have a sprinkler system in there and we just maintain a lawn, but if there's opportunities to do zero scape rock or something like that, you know, that's something that we're looking into. That's great. Um, because I know as a partner in energy and in your communities, <laughs> that is one of the things that is so important to Black Hills Energy as it is to a community. And I would just like to see that go into the presentation, the project, the scope, and not get lost in the shuffle. It is very, um, it's very prison-like when you use the chain link fence. And this would also help the values of the homes around it. And that safety value, it's not as inviting when it looks like uh, there is greenery or grasses and, right, and proper fencing and not as inviting to go in there and, and maybe disturb it. So I think it could be a safety issue as well as a community beautification project. So you've got me on board with that. Yeah, and, and we have to, you know, we're still planning that phase. But like I said, it would be the front, the side where we have constraints and so it, it right now we don't have it planned to be like the Cleveland Street sub and we just can't with the physical constraints but the front we're looking at options to maybe make that look a little more appealing. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you and uh, I have a couple of questions too. Um, first of all thank you for bringing this to our attention and being proactive on these kinds of things is always best for us so thank you. Um, and I, as I was canvassing when I was running for office, you know, I did have concerns from some of the people in, in that area uh, about the power station. So when I, I, did I hear you correctly that this would lower the voltage being delivered around the... So what, what it does, and it, it does the same thing as it does today. So it, it has a, a medium um, sub-transmission voltage coming in, and it lowers the voltage to a distribution voltage. And so the new transformer would do the same thing. It, it lowers it so we can go in the, the alleys and, and to individual houses. So the, the voltage that it operates at will be the same after the oh. project's done. Okay. The purpose, what, what it, the function it serves is to lower that voltage. Okay, gotcha. Yep. And when you talked about the service area, you said there are 3,000 homes, but you didn't really give me a, a I, don't, I don't know, I really did, couldn't visualize your, your area that yeah. you were talking about, like so street to street. Uh, I don't know if anybody, if Mike can help me out a little bit on that. It, uh, we could provide exact maps, but it's not an exact block. It kind of, the, the system is integrated with other systems. Uh -huh. So that's probably I guess we'll west do. Sturg or Sturgis Road, heading west, north and south, probably 10 blocks on each side, roughly. Um, 10 blocks north and south of there and from Sturgis Road over. The next one is on 44th Street, so it'd be somewhere between there, so kind of a, a region there, and we could provide a map of the exact. You know, just because it is my ward, I, I no. was just interested in, in yep. where this, you know, what area this affected, and so, so that's. One thing I'll clarify, and if, if it wasn't clear, is during the construction, customers will not be impacted at all, so they won't know that this work is being done electrically. Okay. So we'll, we actually have you know, right now we'll have plans to um, feed that from a different distribution substation, so uh, they won't know that anything is going on, and, and then when it's done, we'll switch them back on. It should be pretty seamless. Perfect, because I live in that area. I don't, yeah. so <laughs> I don't want my service disrupted. No. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, Chair recognizes Amanda Scott. Thank you, Chair. And that was one of the questions I was going to get to, is how are you going to provide uh, electricity? So. Um, because I thought I heard you say at the beginning that when this project starts in January, December, January, the first thing is is to remove the existing. Correct. So all of, nothing will be energized at that site when you're removing. Correct. Them. Yeah, yep, that's correct. So um, we will backfeed that system from a different um, substation, and then we'll be able to switch that out so it's de-energized um, and completely de-energized until the work is completed, then we'll energize it and both systems will be feeding it and then we'll switch the other one open so then you know customers won't lose service okay in the process yep much i just wanted to add something real quick um talking about communications and safety safety is the key and you're right everything is de-energized when we're doing this but as you know south canyon elementary school is right around the corner from that substation we'll be reaching out and doing some electric safety presentations to the kids even though it's de-energized, we want to remind them of that, what's happening there. Because again, I do know there's a little walk path 
that from West Chicago that takes you back yes. in that site. Mm -hmm. So we're going to communicate to the the school area as well to let the kids know about electric safety, just to make sure everyone understands what's going on. And it'll be barricaded off. You know, during construction, we'll have it barricaded and non-accessible. Okay. And what substation will be feeding the residents of that area? So. Um, my understanding is the 44th Street sub, which is okay. up by Stevens High School. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. The motion on the floor is to acknowledge the, the uh, report presentation from Black Hills Energy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? And the report is acknowledged. That moves us on to item number six and seven. Thanks, item six. Appeal of denied exception request by KTM Design Solutions, Inc. on behalf of BH Capital for LLC to allow for non-standard construction of sanitary sewer main and not to install sewer main in a section of North Creek Drive from proposed North, Creek, North Valley Drive to the railroad. And um, we do have speaker requests, so Mr. Trelaw, if you'd like to come up. Thank you. Uh, Kyle Trelar with uh, KTM Design Solutions representing the owner of the project today. Uh, first, thank you for hearing this item. Uh, always, always fun to come in and, and get to talk. Uh, just to, to start off, I think I'm going to show an overview and just kind of explain what we're asking for. This is an exception that, that came on fairly late in, in the process of, of where we're at. We run through design, move to construction. This was, this was an item that was brought up to us by the contractor as he was looking at the plans. Uh, he proposed this to us, came across as a, a great idea, so we turned in an exception to, to see if, if this was a possibility and, and potentially move forward with this. So it is late in, in the process. We've already had several other exceptions on this project, um, but I'll kind of run through exactly what we're asking for and, and some of the reasoning behind it. North Valley Park is a, approximately a, a 50 acre subdivision that we're working on, have been working on for quite some time. Uh, one of the items that, that we needed to do was bring sewer to this 50 acres of, of property. And, and all along we knew that this was going to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, our nearest sewer is, let me get orientated here, here's East North Street, North Creek Drive, uh, and then we have North Valley Drive that we're constructing. Uh, there is no sewer in uh, North Creek Drive where we're tying into this project. Um, we do, however, at Eglin Street, which is, is up here just off what you can see. There we go. Uh, and north of the railroad tracks, we have our sewer main that runs down Eglin Street and out. So that's, that's our sewer out of this property. Uh, originally, we, we had proposed to construct the sewer main along North Creek Drive. Uh, bore underneath the railroad state the railroad uh, and then bring this up and all the way to our connection point with North Valley Drive uh, and then serve serve the street back to the east uh, one of the things is, is is that we end up bucking grade with this particular design so as as we move up the street our sewer ends up getting deeper to serve our lots back behind so at the intersection here uh, we end up with a manhole that's that's roughly you know 20 to 24 feet deep um, also, uh, we, have, we have water main on the north side of the right-of-way, which limits exactly what we can do there, especially with the deep sewer. And we have utilities just to the, to the um, east, where we have a fiber optic line, we've got gas mains, we've got uh, power lines, all buried that, that we'll have to construct this, this sewer main around. So the, the proposal is, is rather than construct the sewer main along this, this boulevard, along the street, uh, at the depths that we're talking about, this, this 20 feet to 24 feet deep, where we're going to have to have trench boxes and, and we're going to have to have you know, traffic control and, and safety along the street and, and you know, really make sure that we do this right while we work around these utilities, is, is to take it through the property to the east, run it at a shallower grade, 
So closer to the, the standard, you know, eight to 10 foot depth that you would build to, to service buildings. Run it to the south, up to our future street, um, and then back to the west. Uh, this lets us bring the entire sewer main up to a, uh, not near the same depth, so rather than, than 20, 24 foot depth that all of our services will have to come out and be tied to, we can be at that standard eight to 10 foot depth, uh, you know, making it, and making maintenance easier on, on these manholes, these sewer mains. Uh, also, we can, um, as we come across country here, we will we'll provide the, the necessary easements and, and access materials to, to, you know, make the maintenance of this thing easy through this property as well. Um, so it, it, it does several things. It, it number one, uh, you know, it lets us avoid the water main on the north side of Creek Drive. It lets us avoid cutting a, a strip out of the middle of Creek Drive, uh, disrupting the traffic, repaving, and, and once, once you dig into a street, it, it's never quite the same no matter how good you do. Uh, it lets us avoid utilities on the uh, east side of the right of way, uh, the power, the gas mains, fiber optic lines, and it lets us bring that whole sewer shallower. That's, that's kind of the proposal in a nutshell of, of you know, what we're looking to do on this, with this exception. Oh, uh, would you please stand by for some questions from the council? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes Richie Nordstrom. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Thanks for the presentation, Kyle. Uh, but first, if I may, Madam Chair, go to staff. Is it Ted that's running this or Dale? Um, if, if you will give us uh, a little bit of background on the need for that line going down where the, the uh, well, on the, on the drawing that I have is where the X's are shown. And can, address, can you also address the depth of that sewer main as well? I don't know that I can. Uh address the depth. We haven't seen any preliminary information on it. I trust what Mr. Trelore is telling you is true. They'll be um, deeper than average manholes. However, uh, staff's primary concern is running a public utility across uh, over a thousand feet of private property. That is very problematic. Uh, it sounds good today and maybe next year in the next five years it, it may not be a problem but if that property develops, redevelops, we're going to have serious issues trying to maintain that in the future and I'm not talking 10 years from now, I'm talking 60 years from now. So. Uh, that's primary concern is it appears that this is the easy way out. Um, it's not the right thing to do, and that's why staff is so adamant that this not be approved. It's uh, uh, not the most optimum uh, location for this. Uh, adjacent to or within the right-of-way is the correct location for this. There are challenges. We understand that. However, it's the correct location uh, where it was originally identified. Uh, in addition, there is a, a lot that won't be served by uh, the extension where it was originally identified in its original location. Uh, based on the proposal in front of you, there's a lot on the southwest uh, corner of that intersection that won't be served. So that's problematic too um, by taking this alternate location as it cuts off service to adjoining properties as well. Thank you. Um, if I can follow up, Madam Chair. Um, other utilities that we're looking at in this area, the, the water main, is that going to be in a, do you see the, any problems with that in that, in this proposal, in this design? And, and explain again that you have not seen any of these uh, uh, applications or in, in designs or you have not seen any of this? The applicant has submitted a plan just as he had shown that just showed a line on a map. Yes. Uh, as engineers, you look at more than that's called the, the plan view. You look at more than the plan view, you look at the profile, how deep it's going to be, what the grade line is, any conflicts with other buried utilities. We haven't seen any of that. So, yeah, we originally saw the uh, alignment along North Creek Drive there are going to be conflicts. That's the nature of underground utility construction. Unless you're out in a field somewhere where there's nothing, you're going to have conflicts. So, 
And anything to do with the uh, water side of it? I believe there's a crossing or two of the water main, but that's to be expected in this type of construction. Understand. Uh, thank you. I'm going to yield at the, at the moment at, and at, while I contemplate some more issues. Thank you. Chair recognizes Amanda Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Kyle, do you mind answering a question? So as a follow-up to what Mr. Tech said, if when you're going around this other way, he said there's a lot that won't be serviced, what would it take for you to do this alternate route and still service that lot? Is that possible? If you don't mind, I'm going to put this back up here again real quick. So, Dale, correct Dale, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that, that the lot we're talking about is um, back in this area on the west side of Creek Drive. Is that? Uh, right now, we have I've got the city. little cruder but I think it, it still kind of gets the the impression across here's East North Street here's North Creek Drive uh, this this great blue line that I drew in here a few minutes ago that's that's approximately where our streets gonna run into for this subdivision uh, you can see this green line here is, is what we're proposing with the exception uh, we have this lot that that exists right in here uh, along this this right of way that's to be abandoned um, we have with that the uh, manhole that sits right at the southern side of that that, that potentially can serve this lot that we're talking about right now. Um, so it, is Mr. Tech wrong and that if you're in your proposal you are servicing all the lots? We are servicing all of the lots that we're proposing right now. We're uh, servicing or allowing service to this lot to the north uh, west of us, which is, is right here. We'll make sure that we have plenty of room to get a service off into that lot. Uh, we'll have service into this lot and then all of our future lots here. Uh, and then this, this area that we're talking about here, um, what we're saying is, is got the potential to be served by that, that manhole just, just to the south where it was shown on, on the existing server. But, but without this exception, the original design was bringing it along that street and would have logically brought it down and serviced all these lots. So my question to you is, is if you do your other way, can you bring it, continue it on and go ahead and, and service that lot or does that increase your costs? Oh, we could, we could absolutely continue it on. So here's, here's where we're stopping the lot right now. The, the green line here, that's where we're proposing. Uh, the extension, you know, we, it would be the addition of approximately 200 more feet of sewer to construct where we're terminating it in the plan as, as currently um, we have submitted to the city of Rabbit City. So you could serve it, I mean, you could make this. Yep. So, so, okay, now with that being said, because I'm just looking at this and maybe I don't understand the depth and all that other stuff that you've looked at because obviously staff hasn't looked at it yet because they're saying they haven't seen the profile shot of looking at all the other utilities and everything else. But just looking as the crow flies on this map, it looks like what you're proposing and trying to get an exception for is actually more feet of construction or more feet of burying these pipes than the original one just coming down that, that as staff says makes more sense because most of our utilities for public access run along public utilities or public streets already. It, it, am I misreading that? Is it actually shorter to go what you're asking for an exception of? Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely correct. We are adding sewer main into this exception. We are, it, it's uh, slightly longer than what we're proposing through this. Not that much longer, a couple hundred more feet. Um, but here, this is, this is kind of a, uh, the plan and profile view. This is, this is what uh, you know, the, the staff has reviewed for part of the plans here. This is our intersection. This is the manhole we're talking about. You know, we, have, we have with that this, this 25 foot deep, 24 foot deep manhole that, that we're currently proposing. Now I, 
I did take a liberty and I, I just kind of super highlighted some of these these existing utilities to show you kind of what we're looking at in this this corridor we have you know we've got the, the fiber optic we've got the gas in yellow we've got the power in red and you know we're basically threading the sewer at the depths of you know 20 to you know all the way back down to, to 10 feet towards the end of this where we're coming across at the railroad why we haven't submitted additional engineering plans like Dale has said is, is that until we know that the concept is is reasonable then we'll go ahead and, and we'll do a full design but until then the the plan is to construct this the way that the staff has approved like I said it's it's a little unusual to get a an exception request this late into a project but but this one made so much sense uh, it, it'll speed up construction it, it actually lowers the overall cost of this and and provides better service to the lots pro proposed and some of the lots offsite as well so Thanks, Kyle. I, I, I guess I'm missing it with adding more in it and staff would rather have it on the public. You, I, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, you're saying it makes sense to me. I would have to support staff's recommendation because it doesn't make sense to me. So I know that when you're saying other utilities and everything else, I know that when um, development goes into current areas, they have to deal with the same things in those public utility right-of-ways that have already been installed. So I, I'm not, an, it's not making sense to me. So, but thank you for answering my questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Chair, I would like to recognize Ted from Public Works. Thank you. If I could go to the podium for a minute, there's a little confusion on that lot configuration for the Menard Please. site. Mm -hmm. This majority of this highlighted area here is a lot that, that Kyle was referring to previously this sewer coming down in Creek Drive to the south was intended to serve this lot in its entirety with the cooperation of Menards and the developer they have abandoned we've abandoned this right away used to be here moved that connection through here this lot has been split this piece here is going to be a new structure, new building. It'll be served by this extension here. This lot here cannot be served by that unless they build sewer and pump to it. That was the intent of providing this extension or stub here that it can serve this. It was an option when this was one lot that they could use either one since this has been platted. This is really the only feasible option to gravity sewer that it have to be pumped uphill away so we believe that that option should be maintained to serve this lot in the future oops that moves a little faster by hand than it does on the screen so so there's a little confusion the lot not confusion but that previous lot has now been subdivided the right away has been vacated added into those lots and it's changed configuration so this piece would be tough to, to pump uphill and serve there. So that's the intent of, of needing that extension, which there's, I suppose there's an option to put that in shallower from that last manhole to extend it, but it still digs up, still needs to provide sewer to that intersection to serve this lot as we see it. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Um, Chair recognizes, uh, unless there's questions for Ted, Yes, Lisa, yes, yes. okay. Stand, stand by, Ted. Yes. <laughs> uh, Chair recognizes Lisa Modric. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Ted, when you're talking about that capture, and one of the things that stands out is we're dealing with the the 24 foot depth versus the 8 to 10 standard, and and so as we look towards the future, what does that depth do when there is maintenance? When the city has to uh, from work, work within it, and we're dealing with that uh, that today. If we put it in as the original plan was. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Um, it is deeper sewer. There is a higher maintenance potential for it. It's also easier to get to. It's in the right of way at shorter distance. Um, so there's a trade-off. It makes it easier to build now, cheaper in the present, but long term. It's tougher to get to. It, this 
proposed alignment includes two or three manholes, I'm not sure, outside of the right of way in easements in a developed property or future developed property. So that's a consideration as well as the extra distance and the and the radius or the flow through those manholes is somewhat backwards. So it's there's concerns, trades off either way. Okay. We believe building it in the right of way now at the extra depth is a better long term solution than building it somewhere more convenient and more cost effective right now then. And one of the things that uh, he said was by doing the longer way, the, the new vision and purpose of it, that that would have a road to it in some future point, but really without the road on there now, you wouldn't have the access that you need. Is that correct? We wouldn't. Um, our minimum requirement and criteria is an all-weather hmm? art aggregate surface. Mm -hmm. We would expect this to be in the development. I mean, that's intended to be paved or Mm -hmm. The circulation and maneuvering for the future development, I believe there is some talk about that being a heavy truck facility, so there would be be within their property. You know, access would need to be provided, all weather access in some form, but I'd say it's not a secluded road. It's going to be in the middle of an active area and across back lots and property lines. So that could end up being a stipulation is to build the road with this new proposal? That would be a minimum Dale? requirement. It would be a requirement? Yeah. Okay. Is that? Well, it, I, th I think what Mr. Trelore is referring to is our specification says if you have a sewer that is not in a paved surface, you have to put a all-weather surface on it so our jet trucks can drive on it. Mm -hmm. If this is developed, there will be no future road there as of today per their platting uh, that they're requesting, their development plan. So it's going to be cross-country. We have no idea, no control, no inkling of what is going to occur there in the future. It could be someone may want to put a building across it. Somebody may want to put a, a rail facility across it. Something like that that we're not aware of. So that, that's why it's mo most important to locate these facilities in public right of way where we have adequate access to uh, maintain that well into the future. Thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair recognizes Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for Mr. Johnson, if I may. Go ahead. Yep. Ted, uh, if you uh, can share with us a little bit about that. I'm trying to re-envision re this map that you showed us up here, that current depth of the utilities that we have in, in place right now. Can you t share with us a little bit about how that current system is uh, aligned currently? And I'll, I'll explain further once I get an answer why I'm asking you that. I guess I'm a little, I'm sorry, sir. I guess I'm a little concerned on what current system you're asking do, about. So we do not have any sanitary sewer lines up in this area at all? Where this tie-in in North Valley Drive will be, there is no sewer. There's no sewer in that piece of Creek Drive from north of what used to be Camden Drive between lots was two and three Menards up to almost to Eglin. There is no sewer in that section of Creek Drive at the present time. Okay, that, that helps me out a whole bunch. Um, the, the other part of it is, uh, um, and as you can tell, my major concern is getting to the, the, shall I say, the maximum depth of the uh, sanitary sewer line, having access to that. That's, that's my concern is that, uh, creating a, uh, well, it's just a concern of mine is that uh, getting uh, equipment, and if we have to, put staff down in there, an employee has to climb down in that. We do have precautions in place for that. Am I correct? Yes, sir. We have full compliance with confined space entry, safety equipment, staff's trained to do that. So. And the depth, once it gets below chest high or gets down to over your head, you know, it's confined entry regardless of the depth. So the same precautions take, are required regardless of the depth once it, you identify confined space. And basically all manholes are confined space entry. Good. Uh, I appreciate that. And, and I've gone through that <laughs> environment, I, so I understand cl closed uh, 
closed or confined environment uh, for p putting employees in that situation. So um, the, uh, the other part of it is uh, um, the, the future, future road plans that we've got in here, and if we haven't seen anything yet, am I understand correctly, we have not seen from what you're looking at is the profile of this uh, plan? We have not, to my knowledge, we have not seen a profile for the sewer going across country. We do have the one or a preliminary one for the stuff in Creek Drive. The, the previously proposed alignment, we have that. We don't have the other one to see to compare, I guess. I, I would note that with the Creek Drive alignment, we granted an exception to put the sewer outside of the pavement, so it's on the opposite side of the road from the water line. It will you know, encroach close to the pavement, but it's not down the center of the street. That's mainly because the properties that serve is on the east side. We did not see a need to tear up the street to maybe provide one service to cross if that lot to the west ever needed it, north of this intersection. Thank you. I, I'm going to yield. Thank you. Chair recognizes Amanda Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to make a motion to deny the appeal. I'll second. A uh, motion to deny by Scott, second by Nordstrom. All in favor? John. Yes. Oh, excuse me. Oh, John, I'm sorry, John. <laughs> Didn't see you buzz in there. John? I need to abstain from this. Thank you. Okay. Before I call the question, I'm going to um, just jump in here too. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Chalor a couple questions. So the idea behind this is is to make it easier for you guys. I mean, it's obviously not cheaper. It is cheaper. It the, is cheaper. Yeah, and and I can tell you that that the alternate route uh, is is roughly thirty thousand dollars cheaper than than the current approved or current current route that runs down down the right of way so it, it, it's significantly cheaper and and there's a significant time savings on on how long it takes to install it with with those utilities where it's at uh, I would like to just add a, a couple real quick comments on this uh, we will of course uh, and have no objections to providing the all-weather access and and the easements through this property that's that's going to be part of the proposal that's uh, going to come with this uh, the second thing, and, and I don't have a master plan handy with, with what we're doing on, on this area, but it does fit in with our future master plan for that. So, so we're specifically watching where this goes. We're, we're fitting it between those lot lines. We're going to have the, the access over it. We're going to make accommodations for any kind of heavy truck traffic and or train loading or unloading that, that we're proposing through here. So what we're proposing does fit the, the future land use plan that we're talking about. Uh, and, and it does serve this property through there. Now, the, the other item that I'd like to bring up real quick is, is I saw the lot at, that Ted brought over. That's, that's a fairly new submittal. I, I saw it August 1st on there. That's a split, so, so what they're saying is absolutely correct. The way I have it proposed right now, it does not serve that, that new future lot. It, according to Rapid Map, that's still all one lot. Uh, I think that the compromise would be is, is we go ahead and extend what we're proposing another 200 feet and then we we accomplish the same purpose as what we're talking about right now so I guess my problem with with this is is it's really not a complete um, uh, proposal you know you don't have the access in here you don't have that you know other 200 um, feet that you need for um, access to the other lot so um, I would like to uphold your uh, appeal, but there are just some things that are missing here, and I, you know, I'd, I'd like to almost encourage you to go back to the drawing table and think about putting in the access road and putting in the other 200 feet, so that we could have something to look at that would really actually be able to vote on, instead of just an outright denial here, because that's what you're looking at. That's it, I can I can absolutely provide some some preliminary uh, cross sections and, and give you some information on on the access uh, widths and, and where those would come from. That's not a problem. So I could, I could have that ready for, for the city council meeting, no problem. Well, we're um, we'll probably vote on the motion that's on the floor and then see where this goes. Um, so, and Roberts has abstained, so I guess it's up to the rest of us. So 
Uh, the motion on the floor right now is to um, deny the exception request. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. So uh, this appeal has been denied at this point. So we'll see you Monday. Thank you. Okay, Tuesday. Thank Excuse you. me. Tuesday. Uh, yes. Yeah. Ah, yes. Holidays. It looks like Amanda's leaving us. So we'll go on to number seven, the appeal of denied exception request by KTM Design Solutions, Inc. on behalf of BH Capital LLC to waive the requirement to install 24 feet of pavement with uh, and curb and gutter in Valley Drive. And once again, the chair recognizes uh, Kyle Trelar. Once again, Kyle Trelar with KTM Design Solutions, uh, representing the owner for this project. Uh, this this is a, almost a continuation of the ongoing discussion that we have had here on several items. Uh, some some of my clients, some other people's, you know, other projects in this area and whatnot. But you know, this this is basically speaking back to the to the. Um, off-site improvements and, and who's responsible for what and and when does that that need to be constructed and this is just a continuation and and that's that's how the uh, denial of our exception was received back to us was uh, City Council is is taking direction on these and so therefore bring it bring it in front of you guys have you guys take a look at it now this one uh, is on Valley Drive Valley Drive is a future collector street uh, we've had similar exceptions that, that were approved for South Valley Drive. Um, here is a quick master plan. And so right now, this is, this is what we're calling the Diamond Ridge subdivision. This is a workforce affordable home subdivision that we currently have uh, two phases under design. We're about to go into construction on the first phase. Uh, the first phase is an extension of Homestead Street and Cadillac Drive on the uh, east side of this property where I think we have approximately 56 lots that, that we're going to start construction on here pretty soon. So that, that's in the move. Uh, we also, uh, with, this, with this submittal, we had, had requested uh, a phase two, which is for two uh, larger multifamily lots along Valley Drive um, uh, for the, the same purpose of, of providing these affordable and, and workforce ho housing. Um, Valley Drive right now as it exists uh, and this is uh, it's, it's not too terribly bad. Uh, I don't think I'm going to mess with it to try to get it cleaner. Uh, this is Valley Drive uh, looking south along the proposed apartment sites. Uh, we have uh, paved access, we have water, we have sewer, uh, we have uh, drainage ditches in place to, to route the water. We have approximately uh, 20 to 21 feet of, of paved access that, that runs through here. And, and essentially we're asking to leave this and access off of this um, the, the way that it is and in part uh, you know, this is, we were looking at some of the other recently granted exceptions and, and we have Creek Drive, which is just, just uh, you know, uh, about a mile away from here. That's an arterial street, is in worse shape than, than Valley Drive right now. Um, and, and we're basically the same pavement with, so we're, we're asking for, for basically the same exception is, is to allow us to do this. That helps keep these apartments affordable. Um, which is our main goal with this, this entire Diamond Ridge subdivision is to provide affordable housing, much like we're doing to the south on Johnson Ranch. Thank you. Chair recognizes John Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, you know, and I, <laughs> I do agree with Mr. Talor on this one that uh, we should give the exception on this one uh, because of the affordable housing um, aspect of this. But also, I mean, if you look at this one compared to the one that we did up on Country Road, it's almost exactly the same. I mean, except for Country Road should have been three lanes, and this one is only a collector street. So, you know, I think that uh, if we did ask for this street to be upgraded, we're going to end up with a piece of street that's upgraded in the middle of other streets that won't be upgraded for the next 10 or 20 years, and then all of a sudden we have an issue with one piece of the road section, and I don't want to say failing, but becoming older 
as the new comes in. So, you know, this is an a area that's going to develop, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, it's going to develop slowly. I mean, if you look at, at the history of this, this road may or may not be put in over the next decade to completely go through, you know, to East North Street. It will eventually. Um, you know, the only thing I really find unfortunate about this is really on the on the long-term future road map, this should have been an arterial street. You know, really, Creek Drive should not be an arterial street. This one should have been. And it's unfortunate that our long-term planning was, you know, because if you really look at this street, when it's built out, it will go all the way from East North Street to Catron Boulevard and connect into Minnesota. What a better arterial street in Rapid City. But unfortunately, it isn't that way. We're, we are where we are right now. Can I ask you a question on this, Kyle? What uh, right now is there as far as easement on your side? Is it just a, is it a standard 66-foot easement? It's just a section line highway, correct? Section line highway? Yep. Okay. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, hopefully sometime in the future <laughs> this will be an arterial street and I hope that you build far enough the way that that at that point the city can come in and purchase the easement that it will need because we don't plan well enough for the future that someday we will have to do that unfortunately all of us will probably be long gone by then but you know as if you look at at our future planning I, I do have a little heartburn over the fact that this is not an arterial street. And you know, if I remember right, correct me if I'm right, Kyle, but up on the, uh, the north end of this, which would be North Valley Drive going into East North, you had originally uh, planned that to be an arterial, didn't you? That's correct. We, and the, and the city said they did not want an arterial there. And they asked you to come in and, and do a... what. Uh, just, we we, we originally, so we're, we're kind of mixing and matching projects right now, but... Uh, I'm just talking about one end of this road. Yeah, so, on, on the north side, on we, the north we side. had originally proposed the extra right-of-way with, with the offset street to allow for uh, a future arterial street. Um, we ended up having to change that back to a collector-level street uh, due to the comments we received back. Yep, okay. But, uh, you know, I, and like I said, I, I think that this is a good idea at the moment. I think that... We need to definitely cut as many costs as we can on these affordable homes. Um, I do know, you know, I don't know much about the apartments that are being proposed in there. I do know that these lots that are being proposed in there, there is no TIF being proposed, correct? Correct. Uh, and they are going to come in, I believe, cheaper than anything else on the market right at this moment and really close to the price of some that are being proposed with a TIF. So this is affordable, affordable lots. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. A question for Mr. Treeler. Kyle, I was wondering if you had any proposals what these apartments uh, or buildings or these housing units would be, uh, be costing? We have, uh, right now we're, we're in the conceptual design phases. We're working with an architect out of Colorado. They're drawing up the, the layout and the site plan on how these are going to look. Uh, the, exact, the exact price point is, is not tied down just yet, but I can, I can guarantee you that the goal is to meet that market workforce affordability. Thank you. Um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is understanding what is affordable. What what is the definition of affordable housing? Our definition. <laughs> so where where we're shooting for, which is which is uh, taken from from some of the information that we've seen come across, and some of the the, the plans have been put together by the city. Is you know there's there's different levels. We've got the the workforce, which we consider. You know, like uh, in the housing side to be, you know, if, if we're providing the homes in the, the $160,000 range, you know, that, that, that $1,000, $800 to, to $1,200 a month mortgage rate, that's, that's the, the level of affordability. I know on the uh, apartments, and, and you can't hold me to this, but uh, we're, we're talking about that, that 
you know, we're looking for that that six hundred uh, that six hundred dollars a month range for the rents on these apartments. But that's those are those are preliminary numbers right now. Yes, thank you. Uh, if I can ask a follow up to Mr. Young. Sure. Can can you address some of these issues that are being presented today about the uh, definitions for these streets and how they're designated and just a l little bit of clarification and then if I may a follow up. Uh, in, in regards to the designation of Valley Drive, if, uh, if that's not an arterial, perhaps that's something that we need to look at uh, further. Um, I can't speak to the reasoning why it hasn't been at this point. Uh, it's been on the books the way it is for a, a while, but uh, the, there, there could be reasoning for that, but we would have to go back and address why it uh, has its current designation. So if we decide to allow this to go through, is there a change or a potential change to the designation of this street? There could be. There always is that potential. Thank you. Um, and, and can you help me out understanding what, what affordable housing is? <laughs> yeah, that seems to be the, the question of the year. Um, Affordable housing, there, there's a lot of different ways of looking at that. How do we categorize that or where do we draw the line financially as to what fits? Uh, w we tend to look at it more as to what's low income affordable and what's workforce housing affordable. Uh, so the, the 160,000 that Kyle mentioned would fall within the range that we would consider workforce housing affordable if truly that's the, the target they're going after. Um, low income would, uh, would be something anywhere below 125, uh, but above that to about 175 would probably be the range of workforce housing. That's based on various calculations that we're dealing with currently, both locally and state uh, ways of looking at it. And, and one more question for you, Mr. Young, is that uh, um, in the past we've contemplated something along the line of of bringing in, I'm, I'm not sure how to explain this simply, but, but essentially when we're looking at a road improvement in there, we've been talking about some different concepts about uh, a way to get this road built so it isn't falling so heavily on the CIP when it comes up. Um, one of the, one of the uh, concepts that we've talked about is that setting aside some funds for that road improvement. So they don't have to build it today, but they've got some funds set aside. And I see Mr. Tech waving at me. So if, if, if the question is more appropriate for Mr. Tech, then please. Yes, thank you, uh, Alderman Nordstrom. We really have no direction on this. Um, there, certainly throughout all the discussion that we've had on these previous streets where the requirements to make any improvements have been waived, there's been a lot of um, things thrown out. We could do this, we could do that. We, could, we haven't landed on any one particular thing. So to um, you know, speak about, well, them paying something, setting that aside, yep, yeah, that's, an, that's an option, but that is nothing that we've landed on, um, nor do we feel anywhere close to comfortable bringing any policy forward to you until we have more discussion about it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am just concerned about uh, what this is going to have in the long run uh, is future effect for the CIP and how, how that capital improvement planning is going to be affected by putting in the minimums and then, and then these folks having to, to uh, live within the constraints that we have and then later on adding into the uh, adding into the mix of what it's going to cost for the CIP uh, and the, the road improvements for the future. So that's my concern right now. Thank you. Chair recognizes John Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to kind of address some of the things that Richie had said, asked about. Uh, workforce housing from the realtor side. Let, let's go from the realtor and, and the builders and the developer side. Workforce housing is between about 165 and 200,000. That's what we look at it at. Um, you know, and that can depend on, you know, mostly <laughs> one of the big driving factors is lots and lot costs and lot prices and size of lot. Um, you know, and we have been doing some things that have helped us to minimize, 
you know, the size of the lots and be able to build and, and some things with setbacks. And, you know, we've, we've, we've made some progress there. Um, the problem is, is, is the cost and the infrastructure cost. I mean, you, anytime you do a lot, you have to have some profit margin in there. Well, when you have, you know, $25,000, $27,000 on costs on a lot or $30,000, depending on the, the land cost itself, you know, there has to be some type of a profit margin. In there. And then you also have to look at the cost to build and, and you know, permit fees and, you know, all the, all the associated things to building something. And the fact that lumber costs have gone up, you know, 18% in the last 12 months. And you got to figure, you know, everything has to be figured in there. And, you know, low income housing is no longer buildable on the developer side without help from either the federal government, the state government, the local government, the, you know, and affordable housing, Richie, and apartments, that is all, mostly, it's driven by loans. So that depending on what type of loan you get, you know, if it's a HUD loan, you may have to come in at 80, 70, 60, 50 percent of whatever the, the market rate is for apartments. That's driven, you know, by your loans. Developers don't go out and do it on their own because they can't afford it. You cannot afford to build low-income low housing without government help anymore. You just can't do it because the cost is more expensive than what you can recap. So unless you find some billionaire that wants to throw away millions of dollars, you cannot do it because there is no profit margin whatsoever in it. So, you know, when we talk about affordable housing, when we talk about low-income housing, the city needs to help on this. The state needs to help on this. The federal government needs to help on this. You know, and, and the federal government does it through HUD loans, you know, and loans, and the state does it through loans too and some grants. The city, <laughs> that's where it, it can get kind of tricky. I mean, we, we can help out through a TIF, helping in, you know, we can help out through, through giving people variances. You know, I mean, Sometimes we look at this and it doesn't look like it's a, a lot of money. You know, the developer only has to put 100000 or $200,000 into this for a road, but that 100000 might work out to 5000 or $10,000 a lot, which makes it no longer affordable. So, you know, we really have to dig into these when somebody comes in and says, you know, we need this for affordability because it may be, look like a small number to us in the total project cost, but, you know, it may or may not make this project affordable or make the project work because you have to have a certain percentage in it to do it. So, anyway, a lot of this, I'm just trying to say a lot of this is driven anymore, especially low income and affordable is being driven by government. So, thank you. Chair recognizes Lisa Modrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to make a motion. Yay. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to accept the appeal of the exception request in favor of KTM Designs on this property. Second. Uh, a motion by Modrick to um, grant the appeal and a second by uh, Roberts. And, uh, oh, Richie's out of the queue. Okay, so we can go on to uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. One opposition from uh, Councilman Nordstrom, and uh, the appeal is granted at this level. So we'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs> yep. Now we go on to the um, Street Division presentation from Dale Fifley. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of uh, what the street department does. We do patches, potholes, uh, snow removals, and much more. We have uh, 45 employees in our division. We have six operators at nighttime, and all our crew chiefs are working crew chiefs, just so that's up, up there in plain. We have one night crew chief. We have 20 operators through the day, and three daytime crew chiefs, a supervisor that assigns duties to the different uh, 
operators in uh, night shift and the day shift. Myself as a superintendent, I have an administrative secretary, fleet coordinator, 10 mechanics, and one mechanic uh, equipment supervisor. We have a total of 165 different pieces of equipment are at our disposal down there for various different issues. We have a concrete and a guardrail van for working on that type of a, a product. We have uh, saws, viper plates, jackhammers, your, your various different uh, small tools. We have pickups for various different jobs, trailers and compressors. We have two pothole packer trucks. They both have uh, obviously the pothole hotline number on both of them, so everybody can make sure and call on that. We have a safety trailer set up primarily for emergency type situations to assist PD and fire. And we have a 1999 Gilchrist paving machine. Um, Unfortunately, I think this is coming sooner than I'd like to see it, but <laughs> our snow equipment, we have 26 sanders and plows. We have five double wing trucks with sanders, two of them are all wheel drive. We have four pickup trucks with sanders and plows. That's uh, usually what the crew chiefs run around and, or operate through the day. In case we have issues, they can address with those. We have two salt pickups, salt brine. We have uh, five motor graders with wings, two with just uh, straight wind, with just straight uh, blades. We have two front-mounted snowblowers and one self-propelled snowblower. Four bobcats, one backhoe, three front-end loaders, and five trucks with just plows. Uh, the street department duties: we do uh, contractor patches up to 300 square feet. We do that so that we do not compete with the private contractors um, by doing bigger patches. We do, uh, last year we did approximately 450 plus patches throughout the, se the season. Uh, we do probably 98% of the patches for the water and the sewer division. Plus we do additional work for the other divisions throughout the city through the year. Um, and then we, go address problem areas that are going to be you can see coming down the future while staying in communication with engineering to make sure that what we are working on is not coming up on a in a project uh, two years down the road and we just wasted a bunch of time and energy and money doing that so we try to stay in communication with the, each other um, our duties we played and maintain all the alleys and gravel roads within the city we address any concrete issues that we might have. We fix uh, any guardrails that are impacted by vehicles, and then we bill a responsible party for the damage to the guardrail system. Uh, we put out barricades for all the events that we have through our community throughout the season. Um, we also support the police and the fire department in any way ne necessary. A uh, prime example is uh, when Ultramax had their fire out there this last season. We closed off all the roads that were needed to be closed off. We have a, uh, our trailer safety trailer set up and it's ready so all you do is back in hook it up and we can close any street um, in a, just a very reasonably short period of time. Um, and then we, we sweep numerous islands by hand just to make a our city more inviting to the for all of us. Um, our division also goes through the entire city on an in an orderly fashion and sweeps all the residential streets on a daily basis. Uh, in 2017, we swept 2,307 ton of material off the streets. Um, thus far, last week when I checked, in 2018, we've swept 2,596 ton of material off the streets in 2018 which helps us comply with the air quality standards and, and keeps our freshwater fish hatchery in compliance. Um, we then haul all our uh, materials to the, our facility, let it dry out, and then we haul it out to the material recovery facility and use it for cover at the landfill. So it doesn't go to waste there either. Uh, we're we're on, always ready and on call for any natural disaster or an emergency situation on a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week long call. Um, 
we reroute calls from PD to the right divisions, whether it be two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday or any time of day or night. We send them to traffic parks, water, wastewater, state, county. Um, PD usually calls us first and then we tra transfer it from there. Um, we also continue to, to address any concerns the citizens have, obviously on a daily basis. And we work closely with the code enforcement to make sure that if there are any issues that the citizens have that we can help, we pass them on to the citizens or code enforcement, whoever needs it. Um, just some of our very various duties that we do do that kind of, I think, go up unnoticed. Are, we put various different snow fences up in, very, in different locations throughout the city to try and catch the snow to stop it from uh, impacting the streets so heavily. And then we take it down in the, in the spring and put it away and we continue to use it. Um, we put the sander bodies and the snow plows on all our dump trucks in the fall. Then in the spring, we take them out, inspect them, clean them, and uh, store them for the next upcoming year. Um, throughout the winter, if there's any buildup of uh, accumulation that's going to be a hazard, we will remove that um, after any snow event. Um, in a normal work day, any uh, employee down at the division can be on the patch crew. They can go from the patch crew to run on a sweeper to, to be in with the weather change. You could be in a plow truck and then be in a motor grader plowing snow by the end of the day. I have personally done all of that in one day. So it, it does happen. It's, uh, I don't like it, but it does happen. Um, we do have a night shift. They work Sunday night to Thursday, 9, 9 p.m. to 5.30 a.m. Um, their duties are, but not limited, do they sweep all the main lines. Uh, they sweep our downtown core every Sunday night. Um, they just did the downtown core this last Sunday and we had them sweep the alleys and all of it so the whole downtown core was clean because of our uh, mainly try and pick up all the leaves that got knocked down from the other, other day when we had our little summer hail event. Um, they do contractor patches and general patching in all the high traffic areas um, and they pothole patch also makes it safer for the traveling public plus the employees. Uh, and there are eyes and ears at night. If something comes up through the night, they need to get a hold of uh, myself or the, the supervisor down there. The, uh, they can always call us if uh, something comes up. Uh, during snow removal, they have seven different snow routes they're responsible for. There's uh, 23 different schools they have to address within those seven different snow routes. Uh, they also take calls from uh, PD, fire, and dispatch, and then if they need help, they contact us, and then we come in and help them with any of that that's necessary. This is uh, Century Road. It's just a blade that's up. Uh, we maintain all the alleys and stuff. This is a pretty old picture. You can see that it's uh, animals is not through yet, but that's just a blade maintaining Century Road. Uh, this is our sweepers dumping out at the shop. This is a pothole patcher. You can see we always have citizens out there trying to help us out. <laughs> um, but uh, we've got two pothole patchers, which is a huge benefit to our division. Uh, Weather-related duties, uh, we work in, a, in all extreme weather conditions while we continue to use, utilize the best techniques at our disposal. We closely monitor all the forecasts for our surrounding areas so we can be prepared for any upcoming events. That one the other day, uh, Wednesday caught it. I think that caught everybody by surprise. Uh, but during a winter storm event, we, we plow from center line to curb line, and that is for safety of the public and for liability reasons for the city. Um, we, have, we have currently have 19 snow routes for the day crew and seven different snow routes for the night crew. During a snow event, we run two shifts working 15 hours each with a continuous overlap of employees. So one crew will be on 15, the other one will come back, and we'll just keep, keep going and going until it's safe for the public to travel. Um, Rapid City has an estimated of 1,500 lane miles. 
An average cost of salt order uh, from 2014 to 2017 was $557,750. In 2013, it was $951,000. And an estimated cost for this year is going to be around $739,000. That would be to restock our domes. This is one of our double wing trucks headed up Highway 16. As you can see, that uh, he'll cover the entire roadway in one pass with that truck, which saves a lot of time. That's, I mean, that would be three, peop three trucks minimum. So. And this is uh, in the gap down there. You'll see they're not to the curb yet, but there's three trucks there. There's probably, there should be two trucks following them. We make sure that we get everything over. And this next one is just uh, one of our double wing six by six trucks. We put a pre-wet system on them this year that uh, should pre-wet the salt before it hits the road. We're ho hoping that that's gonna reduce our uh, salt usage by hoping a third because it shouldn't bounce and then scatter um, and the mechanics have been they worked on that and they're continuing to work on our other trucks too to get those put on there uh, this is just one of our trucks out during an event and you can see the travel lanes are in pretty good shape skip lanes are got a little little snow on them but looks like everybody's traveling along pretty well and then we've got the 10 mechanics down there they have a wide variety of repairs that they are uh, asked to do. They service all city divisions with the exclusion of the parks department and the sanitation division. Their repairs cover general maintenance like oil changes, brakes, tire repair, lights. Uh, they also do major repairs, engines, transmission, drivetrains. They are required to know how to work on small gas engines all the way up to your large diesel equipment. They have to also know how to operate all, of course, all the electronic diagnostic tools. Everything's becoming computerized. So they're uh, constantly going to school to learn how to operate all that. Um, they all must have a basic knowledge of fabrication and welding skills, plus be able to work on hydraulics. Um, their uh, equipment, again, they're asked to work on anything from small concrete saws all the way up to a blade to the street sweeper. Um, plus, we do obviously maintain all the police department's entire fleet. And then the huge benefit for our division is the after hours they assist us in coming in to plow snow. So that's that's a huge benefit for us. Um, we have an administrative secretary who assists, assists in the correspondence with the other division, pays all the bills, keeps records of all the purchases made. Um, they're obviously our first line of contact with the public uh, when they call in with a concern. And they, you know, they direct the citizens towards the appropriate personnel. They keep track of the staff's vacation, sick leave, and all their annual leave. They're in charge of payroll for the street division. Uh, we do have a fleet maintenance coordinator down, uh, at the street department. They assist in writing specifications for all the uh, equipment purchased by the city. Their assistance is there for any division to utilize at any time as they needed. Um, they, prepare, they prepare the advertising authority, agenda summary, and bid packets needed for the purchase of the equipment. They maintain the, all the records for the equipment repairs and uh, do all the pay, payroll for the street department mechanics. This is a motor grader with a wing on it. That's a front end loader with our snow, one of our snowblowers on it. That's a Gilcrest snowblower. Um, that's a six wheel drive double wing truck that's uh, got the capability of putting a V plow on it in case we end up with uh, another storm atlas and we got that kind of snow. We got the equipment to push through it. And that's the salt dome behind it there. Uh, in closing, I guess uh, the treatment. Street Department does whatever we are called upon to do to make Rapid City the best possible. It can be to live, work, and enjoy that beautiful, beautiful community we are fortunate enough to live in. That's all I've got. If uh, I can answer any questions. Chair recognizes Lisa Modric. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to acknowledge the presentation and retain the floor. Second. Thank you. And I know that uh, 
uh, Darlene's to go for a conference call here quickly, but I want to just say thank you. You truly extend the level of customer service. That 24-hour hotline is magnificent. It really, when, when people call the hotline or if the council calls the hotline for them, they're amazed that same day or next day they get that pothole. So it's a, it's a great service that you do. And uh, one of the questions I've got uh, quickly here, and I know if you have to go, that's fine. Well, we can certainly adjourn. But I just have to ask you, some of the customer complaints, uh, residential complaints, are the way the blades cover up driveways. And I guess there's some other blades that are out there that actually shift those driveway changes so it doesn't uh, berm in. <coughs> Has that been researched and reviewed? Is that maybe something that's going to come down, come, come before us at some point? It's got a wing. It's you're got a name with about, a wing. You're talking about what happens in Sioux Falls with the wing gate, the gates. The wing gate, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't see that being a very feasible avenue for the Rapid City, mainly because um, if you get a certain amount of snow, I believe it's anything over five inches of snow. It may be six. They won't carry it anyway. It it boils off the back. It breaks them. Um, and we've only got seven blades, and if we went to blading the whole town, it would take us Long a time. week. Um, and to get into residentials with it, we don't re we don't get into residentials until it's over six inches of snow. So you're kind of defeating the whole purpose of it. Plus, if you ever look at the when they're bl using the snow gates, there's not a car on the street, mm -hmm. so everybody would have to be ticketed or towed or moved or and I don't know if anybody wants to go there. I know I'm not, but. Well, I appreciate that. That way it goes out to the public. Since they've got this presentation, they get to hear the great services that the streets department gives us, as well as the uh, well-maintained equipment that you provide to. And I just want to thank you for that. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dale, for making these presentations part of our meetings. Um, motion to adjourn. Oh, excuse me, all in favor of acknowledging? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. I know, I'm, <laughs> I'm out of here. Uh, all in favor of adjourning? Aye. Oh, excuse me, we motion. didn't have a motion to adjourn? Thank you, I will. Okay, motion by Modric, second by Nordstrom, all in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned, and I gotta go. <laughs>